All right, first question we have is, since the first resurrection and presentation of the two groups that make up the first fruits have not yet been fulfilled, why do we in the Church of God not include the wave loaves as part of our Pentecost observance each year? Is it because there is no example within the New Testament? Uh, we need to understand the Church of God understands the need to observe the New Testament Passover by taking the symbols of the bread and wine based on the teaching of Jesus to his disciples. We also understand the need that we are to put out leavened products and leavening uh, and abstain from any leavened products during the course of the Days of Unleavened Bread based on God's instructions to each individual family of his people Israel back in Exodus chapters 12 and 13, uh, as well as the example of Jesus and the New Testament church. The Apostle Paul, we know, 1 Corinthians talks about uh, keeping the feast, and he's talking about the days of unleavened bread, and so forth and so on. The practices of the church today, during the spring festival season, are clearly based on God's instructions for personal, individual participation. We must, each one, take the bread and the wine. That is required. We are required to put out the leaven, again, as is brought out by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians. Uh, so that is individual participation. However, we don't bake and lift two loaves of bread in the air on Pentecost because that was not a ceremony a requirement that was assigned to each family of God's people. It was a requirement that was given to the Levitical priesthood to perform. The high priest was to lift the two loaves on behalf of the entire nation of Israel. It was on their behalf that it was they were they were lifted up. The wave loaf ceremony, like the wave sheaf ceremony, was directly attached to the sacrificial system, the ritual system of Israel, and it was connected to the Sinai Covenant, which Paul, the Apostle Paul, noted was made obsolete by the New Covenant back in Hebrews chapter 8. So, again, we don't do it because it was a national thing. Uh, it's just like today, there are certain things we cannot do because it requires the entire nation to do it. Uh, and we're not in that position, so that's why. Now, we're, the next question will get into certain aspects of what was required, what will be required, and what's required today based on the New Covenant. Because we go on in the second question, if Abraham, David, and others listed in Hebrews chapter 11 were required to enter into what we know to be the new covenant with God, why did they offer animal sacrifices and do other things that we are not required to do under the new <coughs> covenant? First of all, it's important to remember that everything involving mankind is directly connected to God the Father's plan of reproducing children who will be given the gift of eternal life, to have eternal life with him and his son Jesus Christ. According to what the Apostle Paul points out in the book of Hebrews, we can go back here to chapter 11, all of those who are listed here in Hebrews chapter 11, who lived by faith, that is, who believed God, and that God rewards all of those who diligently seek him. That's another aspect of it, of not only believing, but diligently, with zeal, seeking to do what he requires us to do. All of those who live by faith in that regard will receive the promise of eternal life in the first resurrection. Now, note here in verse 39 of Hebrews 11, 
And all these, after having listed one after another and then not even using names but telling us about the events, and we can go back in, in the Old Testament and find those individuals, but he says, in all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith. That is, they lived their lives based on their belief that God was God, and God would diligently reward those, or God would reward those who diligently seek him. Anyway, having obtained a good testimony through faith, through that belief, did not receive the promise. That is, they have not yet received the promise of eternal life. The complete Jewish Bible better renders verse 40 because God had planned something better that would involve us. Now that something better that involved us was the fact that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and lived among and set an example and gave teaching about the covenant that was not given directly to ancient Israel, was not exactly in the Old Testament, hence we've got a New Testament today. But at any rate, he planned something better. Something better. The, this, the first resurrection would include all of those who have participated in this first day of judgment for salvation. Something better that would involve us so that so only with us would they be brought to the goal or made perfect, as the New King James brings out. The qualification that must be met in order to receive eternal life is to believe on Jesus Christ. Let's go back over to John chapter 6 and find that this is the case. John chapter 6 and verse 47. Jesus stated, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, or on me, as the King James would have, he who believes on me has everlasting life. So what does it require to have everlasting or eternal life? To believe on Jesus Christ. Since all of those of faith, as we're told in Hebrews chapter 11, since all of those listed in Hebrews chapter 11 only knew the one who would become Jesus Christ, that is, they only knew God the Word. That was the being they knew. And so they believed on Him. Believing on Christ, whether prior to or after His coming as a mortal, requires being totally convicted that He, Jesus Christ, or God the Word prior, same individual, that He is God and that salvation is possible only through him. That's what's required. Those listed in Hebrews chapter 11 who had that belief were driven to stay in a close relationship with God and be obedient to his instructions. Hence, they diligently sought him. What does he require? They diligently sought to do what he required. The promise of eternal life is found only in the new covenant. It's not proposed in the Sinai covenant. It is shown very clearly to be in the new covenant, which will only be new, a new covenant, to the descendants of Israel who had been bound to the covenant made with God at Mount Sinai, as Jeremiah brings out back in Jeremiah chapter 31. Let's go back to Jeremiah and note this. Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. Jeremiah writes, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, so you see, they've already been under a covenant. Now it's a new covenant. In the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they, for all, they all shall know me. Not just a few, not just one here and there, but they all, it says, shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now God further reveals that his righteousness and forgiveness and a new relationship with Israel at the outset of the second day of judgment for salvation will involve a total change in the way they think, which will be made possible by the power of his spirit. This additional information is given in Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 and in verse 22. Ezekiel 36 verse 22. Ezekiel is told, Therefore, say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel. That is what I'm about to do, what I'm about to tell you. But for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. Notice, I'm going to be hallowed in you. My holiness is going to be reflected by you, this is what he's telling them. For I will take, verse 24, I'll take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. The gift of eternal life will be given only to those who know Jesus Christ and respond to his instructions. They must believe on him, they must obey him, which requires acknowledging and repenting of their sins and recognizing their need for the power of God's Spirit to enable them to renew their minds by bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, as we're told in Romans 12 and 2 Corinthians chapter 10. This is the way of life that is to be lived by every individual selected by God to be judged during this first day of judgment for salvation, which included each one of the individuals listed in Hebrews chapter 11. They too were recipients of the Spirit of God, which the Apostle Peter refers to back in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And verse 10. 1 Peter 1, verse 10. The King James states, Of which, now Peter's gone through and talked about salvation, and then he says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, referring to the church, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Now how could it be the Spirit of Christ? Because Christ during that time was God the Word. Remember, God the Word came in the flesh, the same being, the same consciousness, but he came in the flesh. So it was the Spirit of God the Word which was in them because that word became Jesus Christ, the Logos, and dwelt among men. 
when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So, in order to receive eternal life, you must have the Spirit of God. And so all of those in Hebrews chapter 11 that are to get the promise, to receive the promise of eternal life, had to have had the Spirit of God. Now that we've reviewed the covenant that's required to be made by God or with God in order to receive the promise of the gift of eternal life, we can address now the remainder of the question, which was, why were those in Hebrews 11 required to do things that are not required of us today? God chose to reveal his plan in stages by using men to record his revelation over the course of the first 4,000 years after the creation of man. During that span of time, during those four millennia, the ones selected to record the experiences of individuals and nations were affected by some of those experiences that the nations and the people were experiencing themselves. They also were often, the ones who recorded the prophets, they were often required to perform physical acts in order to either learn spiritual lessons for themselves or to become examples of those, or for examples for those who would later be selected for Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now all these things, now here Paul is specifically talking about Israel uh, following Moses through the Red Sea, coming out of Egypt, coming to the Promised Land, etc. All these things happened to them as examples. They were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And again, Paul is writing to the congregation in Corinth that's been preserved for us today, for this is for the church. And so these things are for our good. But in Romans chapter 15, he goes on to say that not just what happened to Israel coming out of Egypt, but everything that's contained in the Holy Scriptures. Notice verse 4, Romans 15 verse 4. I'll read this one from the New Revised Standard. And here, Paul states, For whatever was written in former days, that is, all of the Holy Scriptures, was written for our instruction, our, the churches, the disciples of Jesus Christ, our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. So it was all for us. And so what the prophets went through, their examples, their hardships, whatever, it was for our good. Now, in regard to the specific reference to animal sacrifices in this question, it's important to remember that during the millennium, that second day of judgment for salvation, during the millennium, when the new covenant will be made, well, it will be the only covenant that God makes with mankind, animal sacrifices will be offered by those who will be under that covenant led by the Spirit of God. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 45 and note this. Ezekiel chapter 45 and verse 18. I'll read this passage from the Tanakh translation. Thus said the Lord God. Now, earlier uh, in chapter 43, we find God returning where he s establishes that his feet will dwell then in Jerusalem this point on. So this is after his return. We're talking about events here after his return. The millennium has begun. Thus said the Lord God, on the first day of the first month, you shall take a bull of the herd without blemish, and you shall cleanse the sanctuary. How? The prince shall take some of the blood of the sin offering and apply it to the doorposts of the temple, to the four corners of the ledge of the altar, and to the doorposts of the gate of the inner court. You shall do the same on the seventh day of the month to purge the temple from uncleanness caused by unwitting or ignorant persons. 
On the 14th day of the first month, you shall have the Passover sacrifice. And during a festival of seven days, unleavened bread shall be eaten. <clears throat> On that day, the prince, that is the physical ruler, descendant of David, shall provide a bull of sin offering on behalf of himself and of the entire population, that is the whole nation. And during the seven days of the festival, he shall provide daily for seven days seven bulls and seven rams without blemish for a burnt offering to the Lord, and one goat daily for a sin offering. He shall provide a meal offering of an ephah for each bull and an ephah for each ram with a hen of oil to every ephah. So too during the festival of the seventh month for seven days from the fifteenth day on he shall provide the same sin offerings, burnt offerings, meal offerings, and oil. And so everybody, remember we read already in Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, that all will have their minds open, and they will be given the Spirit of God. And so these are converted people who are making these animal sacrifices, but that's what we are shown is going to happen. Now, even though we may not today be required to perform physical actions or rituals that have been done by those from the past who are listed in Hebrews chapter 11, or those in the future who will be under the new covenant, we today, just like those from the past and those who will be in the future, must believe on Jesus Christ as our Savior and use God's Spirit to renew our minds as we diligently seek to become perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. That's what our job is. So, we're not always required to do everything that was done. God has not asked any of us to strip our clothes off like Isaiah and run around and make proclamations. He hasn't asked us to dig holes through uh, houses in order that we can uh, you know, imitate or pantomime uh, an escape uh, you know, from, from captivity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, he hasn't asked us to do those things. He has not asked us today. But, and again, we can't. The, the sacrificial system is not done today because it takes the entire nation. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, it's the way it's supposed to be. They're not doing them in Israel yet, but they will. It is going to happen. Sacrifices will happen, but basically by unconverted people at least in this age, before Christ returns. So, anyway, hopefully that thoroughly answers the question. All right, the next question. You, that's me, you have stated, unless I'm in error, that in order for someone to be an apostle, they had to be directly taught by Christ. You use this in your argument about HWA not being an apostle. If that is your argument, then we have an issue because unless you can show me in Scripture that Barnabas was taught directly by Christ, because in Acts 14.14, 14, he is described as being an apostle. Okay, I have taught, I know that, that an apostle must be a witness of Jesus Christ resurrected. Now that's based on what the Apostle Paul writes back in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 1. Here, Paul, writing to the congregation in Corinth, makes the statement, Am I not an apostle? Okay, the apostle means one sent, one who has been designated for a, a role, a responsibility. Am I not free? That means he, in his station or whatever, was free to go wherever Christ sent him as an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? He's connecting this to his apostleship. Are you not my work in the Lord? Are you not my work? In other words, are you not the fruit produced by Jesus Christ from the message that I, who was sent to you, have brought? 
So he's talking here about you know, proof to them that he's an apostle. And part of that was seeing the resurrected Jesus Christ. Jesus manifested himself to the apostle Paul on several occasions. Let's go back to Acts 26. And Jesus not only appeared to him, he also taught the apostle Paul. Uh, at least according to what we read in several places in the book of Acts. But here in chapter 26, verse 16, I'll read from the complete Jewish Bible. But uh, here Paul again is defending himself before uh, King Agrippa and others. And he says, uh, relating the story of what happened when he was stricken uh, as he was going to Damascus to arrest Christians, uh, Jesus said to him, but get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you to serve and bear witness. That means you're going to be an apostle. Appointed you to serve and bear witness to what you have already seen of me and to what you will see when I appear to you in the future. So it's very clear that Jesus appeared to him. In fact, in Galatians chapter 1, Galatians 1 and verse 11, here Paul uh, writing to the churches, the congregation spread throughout the region of Galatia. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. And much of that gospel, the good news that he was taught, came during the time he spent in Arabia. Remember, he went from Damascus to Arabia, and he stayed there for some time and then came back. So that, again, is through revelation. Jesus came to him and revealed these things. In Acts chapter 23, And verse 11, this is one of the times when Christ appeared to him. It says, but on the following night, the Lord stood by him, that is, stood by Paul, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. All right, so we can't, you know, we can't uh, say, no, Paul never saw Jesus. Yes, he did. He saw the resurrected Christ. Now, he may have seen Jesus, you know, while he was in the flesh as well. Because Paul was taught by Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was headquartered in, that's right, Jerusalem. He was there, part of the Sanhedrin. You know, we read about him in, in the book of Acts earlier. Uh, and so Paul could very well have seen him and may have begun hating him. Uh, during the time when maybe he witnessed Jesus speaking. Maybe he was even among some of the Pharisees that were there. See, we don't know all of the information. He doesn't tell us. He could have been part of those that were very rabid in attacking Jesus. We don't know. But we do know that he certainly had gone to Jerusalem off and on during the time when Jesus would be there, you know, during the Holy Day periods. I believe that in addition to Paul, there is plenty of evidence, sufficient evidence, that Barnabas had been taught by and had been seen, or he had seen Jesus both before and after his death and resurrection. The reason I say that, let's go back to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We find here in verse 36 that Barnabas was well known by the apostles. It says here, and I'll read from the New Revised Standard, verse 36, There was a Levite, a native of Cyprus, Joseph, to whom the apostles gave the name Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was an encourager. Now for them the apostles to have known Barnabas this well 
They must have spent some span of time together in order to watch his interactions and to see, to, to call him the son of encouragement means it wasn't he just encouraged one person once, but they saw that this was, this was kind of the way he was, a very positive uh, individual, always pointing out the positive things and encouraging people. So they had to have known him rather than just meeting him on the street and saying, oh, well, you seem to be, let's call you Barnabas because you look like somebody who's encouraging. No, it was because of his actions that they gave him this designation. Also, Barnabas was among the disciples. I mean, look where we find this in chapter 4. Look how close this is to, to chapters 1 and 2. Time-wise, as far as the, the length of time that, that's 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 gone by. He was among the disciples in Jerusalem in the days following Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was first poured out on 120 disciples of Jesus and then later that day on about another 3,000 after Peter had given his sermon. And so Barnabas was there at that point in time. He was one who, as we see here in verse 37, uh, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, when was this? This was shortly after Pentecost. That's the time frame. Put all, everything together in chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's all right there. This indicates that he was almost certainly one of the 120 disciples who had followed Jesus during part of his three-and-a-half-year ministry, though he did not follow as extensively as did Justice and Matthias, who were the only candidates we find back here in chapter 1. They were the only candidates with the qualifications to replace Judas Iscariot. Barnabas didn't meet those qualifications because we're told here in verse 21, Acts 121, Therefore, of these men, the apostles, are, the eleven, are talking among themselves, trying to decide who replaces Judas Iscariot as one of the twelve. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us, note, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John, going all the way back to being a disciple of John the Baptist. In order to replace Judas, you've got to go back that far, is what this is saying. To the day when he was taken up from us. That is, the day he ascended from the Mount of Olives to go to the right hand of the Father. In order to be a replacement, you had to have been at least going all the way back to John the Baptist's time to the ascension. Barnabas didn't meet those qualifications because they, it says here that... Uh, the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. What is an apostle? An apostle is one sin, but he is a witness. He, he, he gives testimony. I have seen the resurrected Christ. And that's what this tells us. Must, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Because he's replacing another apostle. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. So Barnabas was either among the more than 500 disciples who saw Jesus after his resurrection in Galilee uh, that uh, the Apostle Paul mentions back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, or, and possibly also, one of the two unnamed disciples that we find that were walking on the road to Emmaus and were accompanied by Jesus. And later, they were with the eleven, you know, in the room. The doors are all closed when Jesus appeared to them. Barnabas could have been one of those individuals because we're never told who their, what their names are. He was probably among the disciples at Jerusalem who witnessed Jesus ascending in the clouds. Because that's what he did. And, again, it says here, although 
Barnabas obviously did not go all the way back to John the Baptist time, apparently, because he's not named as one of the individuals, but he could very well have been one of the ones standing there on the Mount of Olives and watching Jesus ascend and the two angels appear. He could have been one of those. Since God, through the Holy Spirit, ordered Barnabas, along with Paul, to be appointed as apostles in Acts chapter 13, he had to have seen the resurrected Christ. Because again, as it says here in verse 22, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And to me, that pretty well sums it up. You've got to have seen the resurrected Christ in order to be an apostle. All right, any, any questions on that one? All right, we'll move on. Next question involves Proverbs 24 and James 5. Proverbs 24. And verse 10. Proverbs 24, 10. I'll read from the New International. If you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Now, that's kind of a, might be good for us to think about in this day and time, okay? Because we're certainly into a very troublous time. So, if you falter in a time of trouble, how small is your strength? Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? In other words, you can't come up with an excuse if you know. Does, he, does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? All right. The questioner goes on to say, Is this equivalent to James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20? All right, James 5. 19. Here, James writes to the church, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, notice how he begins this, brethren. This, this letter is written to the disciples of Jesus Christ. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, questioner goes or asks, does this mean that we are expected to go to people in the world and point out their sins that are leading them to eternal death? All right. James, here in chapter 5, is clearly addressing the need to show care and concern, the care and concern of godly love, of agape, to brethren who have slipped and who veered away from the truth because it's addressed to brethren and so that's who he's talking to us about here in James however according to the Apostle Paul back in the book of Galatians chapter 6 I think it's verse 1 this instruction that's given here in James must be carried out only by those who are spiritually minded with pure godly motivation. That's what Paul tells us. The Proverbs instruction can be understood universally as the need to show concern for others in or out of the church, those who are jeopardizing their physical lives, and can also apply to helping brethren who are jeopardizing their spiritual lives. Both passages are based on God's command back in Leviticus chapter 19. Back in Leviticus 19, where we are first told to love our neighbor as ourself, we find here in verse 16, Leviticus 19 verse 16, and I'll read this from the New Living Translation. It says, do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. And note this, do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. 
I am the Lord. Now that plays right in to both of these, whether it be Proverbs, which is talking about you know, mankind in general, or James, which is talking strictly about those within the body of Christ. These passages are not justification, however, for interfering in the lives of worldly people. Now, if you see someone, your neighbor, you know, in the world, uh, you know, is, is about to uh, have a ladder or something fall on him, then yes, you know, take some action. You know, it, that, that certainly applies. But we're warned about staying out of situations where our concern is not wanted. And to go and say, you know what, uh, if you're not keeping the Sabbath and you are heading toward eternal death, and I'm here just to warn you and let you know. No, now you're cutting your neighbor off for good. All right? In Ephesians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul tells us how we are to basically fulfill Proverbs uh, chapter 24 and uh, verses 10, 11, whatever. Uh, in Ephesians 5 verse 11, again from the New Living Translation, the Apostle Paul writes, Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret. But their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. For the light makes everything visible. The Christian's duty as a light to the world. Remember, uh, you know, at the very outset of the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus goes through and begins talking about the terms and conditions of the new covenant, uh, he one of the first things he tells tells uh, tells us there in about verse fourteen or fifteen is, "You are light to the world. You are the light of the world." You know, and you don't take a light and put a basket or something over it so it can't be seen. You put it on top of a hill so that the light can be seen from all around. And he tells us that is our responsibility. We are to be lights to the world, to let the light of Jesus Christ be reflected from us in the way we live, in word and deed. Then be prepared to humbly explain our way of life to those who ask us about our conduct why we do what we do. I see you, you're always dressed up, and on Saturday, you go somewhere, and you come back, and you know, what's going on? Okay, that's one thing, but to say, hey, you're mowing your grass, that's going to get you eternal death. No, we don't go out, and uh, that's not our job. You know, our job is to be a light to the world. That's what Jesus says. Not megaphones, but lights. Anyway, but again, if you see somebody who's about to, you know, your neighbor's falling out of a boat, you're going to help your neighbor, whether he's in the church or out of the church. I mean, that certainly is applicable. But when it comes to, you know, are we trying to protect them from eternal death? Uh, that's God's job. Uh, we can be a light. If they ask us, we can do what we can. Anything further on that one? All right, next question is in Job chapter 19. Job 19, verse 17. <clears throat> now, we find here in the context, Job is speaking here, not one of his friends. And he says, My breath is offensive to my wife, and I am repulsive to the children of my own body. Even young children despise me. I arise, and they speak against me. All right. Question. At the time Job was experiencing his trials, was God already blessing him with more children? I thought all of his children <clears throat> were killed when Satan began tormenting him. Yes, according to chapter 1, I think verse 19, all of his children were killed when the house that they were in celebrating whatever collapsed on them, when the great wind came, remember? And it collapsed, killed every one of them. 
With that information, it is very clear that verse 17 has not been correctly translated in the King James or the New King James. I just say those two because most of the others at least attempt to get it right. The Hebrew that is translated children of my own body, okay, in the King James, New King James, literally means sons of my womb or sons of my belly. Since Job had no womb, yes, the Bible does point out differences in gender. Okay. So, since Job had no womb, several translations have concluded the intent was the womb of Job's mother, which means that this should be his siblings. Not his children, but his siblings. The American Standard Version has the children of mine own mother, the English trans, uh, Standard Version has the children of my own mother. The New American Standard has my own brothers. The New Revised Standard, Complete Jewish Bible, Revised English Bible, the New International, all have my own family. My own family. You know, they, I'm repulsive to them. However, that's, you know, if it's children or sons of my womb then that's the way they look at it. But if the Hebrew, and again, it can be the sons of my belly, then this would refer to the descendants of Job, from Job and not from his mother, but from Job, and it could mean his grandchildren. Okay. So, but it's not his children, because his children are all dead. Could be his grandchildren. You know, we're not... There's no indication that they were in the house when everything collapsed either. So, anything further on that one? All right, <clears throat> let's see. Next question, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse All right, Paul writes, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Okay, question. What translations properly translate the Greek which is rendered falling away in this passage? To correctly understand doctrine, we're required to fully investigate all Scripture. As it says back in Isaiah 28, <clears throat> Isaiah 28, verse 9, King James translates, Whom shall he teach knowledge? That is, who will God teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? The answer, them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. For, for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Correctly understanding end time prophecies requires the same. Here a little, there a little. You've got to go here, got to go there. And basically, you go to the Old Testament, you read the prophets and... Other than Daniel putting some things together, it's when in the world did these things happen? That's the reason God inspired John to record the book of Revelation. Because it's an outline, you can put everything together if you just rely on the outline in Revelation. You can find where everything goes. Now, it also necessitates analyzing the chronological flow of events within that outline of prophecy in order to know the correct place to put things. On more than a few occasions, uh, members of the church have incorrectly connected prophetic passages to personal experiences. Many have done so with this passage here in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. Many have 
made the assumption, and that's all it is. They made the assumption that the falling away, because you go back, well, that's what the King James says, King James. Well, King James is not always right. Sometimes King James chose to translate something differently, uh, and it kind of throws everybody off. But many have made the assumption that the falling away refers to people who left the doctrines of WCG. Okay. Oh, they, they fell away. This is what this is talking about. Now that that's happened, you know, prophecy can... No, that's not what this is talking about. Falling away from the faith has been a recurring problem in church history. After all, the Apostle Paul, Apostle Peter, Apostle John... Apostle Jude, they all indicated the problem of falling away from the faith was occurring through the first century. You know, Paul, all of those in Asia have forsaken me. I mean, you know, there, there was a lot of falling away going on. So what was witnessed in the destruction of WCG was not unique in the course of church history and cannot be used as the indicator of when the man of sin will appear on the scene. Simply can't be. The term falling away, as I've mentioned many times before, is translated from the Greek word apostasia. Apostasia. Which is translated apostasy in the New, uh, in the new American Standard and Complete Jewish Bible. They both use the term apostasy. The definition of apostasia in Strong's Concordance is defection from truth, defection from the state, falling away, forsake. All right, that is a very limited uh, concordance, if you will, uh, as far as giving the meaning of these words. The more thorough definition of apostasia from the Bauer Danker. Arndt and Gingrich's Greek lexicon of the New Testament, that's kind of the, you know, the Rolls Royce of lexicons, uh, is defiance of established system or authority, rebellion, abandonment, breach of faith. Those are the definitions from the BDAG, as they call it. It is the more thorough definition emphasizing rebellion that the majority, majority of translators have chosen to use. The Revised English Bible, getting to the answer of the question, which translation, the Revised English Bible translates this, before the final rebellion against God. The Goodspeed translates it, not until the rebellion takes place. The New International until the rebellion occurs. The Revised Standard, the New Revised Standard, unless the rebellion comes first. Moffat, till the rebellion takes place first of all. Lamsa, unless it is preceded by a rebellion. So you'll notice that most of the translators have decided to use the more thorough, more accurate translation. When we analyze the chronological outline of prophetic events in the book of Revelation, let's go back to chapter 12. We find here in chapter 12 there is indeed a rebellion that immediately precedes the time when the beast will appear. Here in Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. Now it almost seems like he's cast down now when we see the amount of hatred, the unbridled hatred that has sprung, sprung up everywhere. But I don't think he has. 
I think he's doing everything he can. Something's going to really make him mad, however. And then when it looks like he's being thwarted, then he's going to make his ascension. Then he's going to engage Michael and his angels. And then the war will occur, and then he'll be cast down. And then bad things happen. Going on in verse 12 of Revelation 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. So, when he's cast down, he's going to do some pretty powerful things. The Apostle Paul, back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, goes on to show here, chapter 2, He goes on to show that the devil empowers the beast once he's cast down. When you go to verse 4, you know, he is sitting as God. That is, he's sitting as supreme, claiming godly power. And then we go on to find that down in verse 9, uh, the coming of the lawless one. The lawless one? Verse 3, it's a man of sin, man of lawlessness. Okay? The coming of the lawless one, who is the beast, is according to the working of Satan. He can't come on the scene. He cannot appear until Satan comes down and possesses that man. And once he does, the devil, with the amount of arrogance he has, he's not going to wait around in the, the shadows, you know, in the, the room next door. He's going to be right out there in the open when all of this happens. And according to the working of Satan, how? With all power, signs, and lying wonders. Now, of course, the first one possessed is the man who is known as the false prophet because he is enabled to call fire down from heaven. And will that catch the attention of the world? You better believe it. In this day of Internet, when somebody can sneeze in Mongolia and you can know about it in less than two minutes, yes. Yes, there will be no question everybody will be aware when that event occurs. So anyway, anything further on that? I think uh, I've gone through most of the translations where it's correctly translated. Okay, next, Psalm 104. Psalm 104. <clears throat> well, I won't read the whole thing. It just says here, Psalm 104 is a beautiful millennial song about the recreation days. So, it is historic as well as prophetic. Do you think that, do you think that since the earth will be tohu vabohu, as Jeremiah brings out in Jeremiah 4.23, when Christ returns, that he will recreate it in seven literal days? Now, the reason for the scope of tohu the bohu, or total devastation that we read about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, and in Jeremiah uh, 4.23, uh, is systematically, this, the scope of that is laid out for us in the trumpet plagues and the bowl plagues in Revelation uh, chapters 8, 9, part of 11, and 16. Okay, We've got all of those summarized in those areas. The aftermath of those plagues will be what? It will be toxic, radiation-filled air, scorched earth, lifeless seas, undrinkable water, and the list goes on and on. You know, the seas are dead. The water's undrinkable. The air virtually unbreathable. It will be crucial for Jesus Christ to take immediate action to clean the air and the water, to reestablish vegetation, and by that, including fully matured crops that have food on them for human beings to eat, restore animal life in the fresh as well as the salt waters, and much more. It's going to be necessary to do it right away because everything's gone. Water's not drinkable, air, if you're going to die, if you keep breathing that air, and nothing to eat because it's, it's gone. There's a nuclear war that's going to destroy a third of humankind, and will take out most of the animal kingdom as well. Okay. 
You know, it's it's going to be a horrendous thing. Many scriptures point to what Jesus will do upon his return once he comes to Jerusalem and begins his reign. In Isaiah chapter 41, let's note, Isaiah 41, And <clears throat> verse 18. In verse 18, he says, God says, I will open rivers in desolate heights. Uh, skipping down, I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Uh, I will plant, verse 19, I will plant the, in the wilderness the cedar and the acacia tree. He goes on, skipping down, I will set in the desert the cypress tree and the pine. Now, not that he puts a seed there for it to grow. He's talking about instantly he is going to bring forests into being and rivers and streams into being. I mean, that's what he did back in Genesis chapter 1. Everything was destroyed in one day. The entire, entire planet is, you know, is thoroughly destroyed lush with vegetation, all in the same day. In chapter 35 of Isaiah, here in verse 1, the wilderness and solitary places <clears throat> shall be glad. It says, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. It goes on in verse 2 to say that the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. So deserts are now covered with forests. That's what he's saying. Chapter 51 of Isaiah. Chapter 51, verse 3. For the Lord will comfort Zion. He's skipping down a little. He says, he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Now, that is quite a change, but the whole world's going to be pretty much a desert, a wilderness. When you have the sun that heats up seven times in intensity and scorches the earth, there's not going to be much left. God's going to have to do this. He's going to have to do it fairly quickly. Now, these and many other scriptures show that much recreation will occur, but those scriptures don't reveal the specific amount of time that will elapse in order for the whole world to be taken care of. Now, God does reveal in Zechariah 14, about verses 8 or 9, there he tells us, as well as Ezekiel, most of chapter 47 of Ezekiel, he tells us that restoration begins in the land of Israel and spreads out from there. He talks about these the waters that go to the east and to the west, and wherever those waters go. Those, they're healing waters that flow from Jerusalem. And wherever the water goes, talks about fruit trees and nut trees immediately growing to mature size and bearing something to eat. And fish, you know, fish are abundant. They're, they're multiplying like crazy. And so you've got fish to eat and fruits and nuts and Again, that would spread out to all of, all of the earth and where there is the need. However, with all of the in information we're given, there's no implication as to the number of days or weeks or maybe months that it takes for this to completely go out to all of the earth. Now, I, I can't imagine it being months because the air is going to have to be cleaned up and the water is going to have to be cleaned up like right away because people are going to all be dead if it isn't. And God says he's not going to destroy all human life. It just isn't going to happen. So anyway, uh, seven literal days, maybe, but there's not a scripture that says it. And I don't know if in seven days the waters will. Waters can go really fast, you know, whatever God wants to do. He can make those waters uh, lickety split go all over the world. It doesn't take a whole long time. Uh, as we know, all the currents of the oceans move water around so that 
uh, eventually they they're all changing places and there's water that evaporates and comes in and drenches the earth with water it's you know it's all a cycle but uh, I don't think it's going to take the normal cycle it's going to be sped up dramatically all right, anything further on that one all right next question Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 and 2 I'll read from the New American Standard Translation. It says, But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. All right. In this Messianic prophecy, why is Galilee referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles? Well, this prophecy was recorded by the prophet Isaiah after the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser had conquered the Galilee region of the northern kingdom uh, of Israel and taken the Israelites into exile uh, in the years 733 to 732. So this event had occurred. In Isaiah's day, this was now Galilee of the Gentiles because the Assyrians, it was under their dominion. God allowed this event in order to symbolically humble that region centuries before the Messiah would appear, who was the light of the world who would come there. And again, it says there will be no more gloom because the people who walked in darkness will see a great light. It's a reference to the coming of the light of the world, the Messiah. But that's the reason it was called Galilee of the Gentiles. All right, one more question, I think. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, I uh, <clears throat> had a couple of questions on this and uh, a couple of different I know what they're talking, I know what, why they're asking the question, but anyway. When Christ returns and stands on the Mount of Olives and it splits in two, who are those that will flee through the mountain valley? All right, it's important to establish when, in the order of prophecies, that event is fulfilled. God revealed through the prophet Ezekiel that the glory of God was removed in a specific order from the location of the temple in Jerusalem and will be restored. His glory, his presence will be restored in the reverse order. In chapters 8 through 11 of Ezekiel, the details of the departure of God's glory is given. And then in chapter 43, we have the, rec the recording of his return, when he finally returns and backtracks. In chapter 8 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel is carried in vision to the temple in Jerusalem where he saw God in his glory seated on his throne. That's brought out in the first four or five verses of chapter 8. God then left the temple and went to the east gate. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 10 and note this. We need to see this and understand that there is a procedure, a sequence that must be kept in mind as we address this question. Ezekiel 10 verse 18, I'll read from the Tanakh translation. Then the presence of the Lord, now anytime Tanakh uses presence, it's glory. Glory. Then the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, left the platform or the threshold of the house or the temple, as other translations have it, and stopped above the cherubim or the cherubs. And I saw the cherubs lift their wings and rise from the earth with the wheels beside them as they departed. And they stopped at the entrance of the eastern gate of the house of the Lord with the presence or the glory of the God of Israel above them. So they went from the temple over to the east gate, just before leaving out the gate to outside Jerusalem. That's where you know, God went 
on this platform that the uh, four cherubim are carrying him. Again, we, we all know Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10 and all the information about uh, the cherubim and the throne of God being moved around. From inside the walls of the east gate, God then moved on to the Mount of Olives. Because in chapter 11 and verse 22, again from the Tanakh, 11, Ezekiel 11, 22, Then the cherubs, with the wheels beside them, lifted their wings, while the presence of the God of Israel rested above them. The presence of the Lord ascended from the midst of the city and stood on the hill east of the city. Now that hill is the Mount of Olives. You know, look at any map. That's what's there, is the Mount of Olives. Started at the temple, went to the east gate, and then finally stood on the Mount of Olives. From there, you know, he lifted up and left because Ezekiel, the, the vision ends for Ezekiel. Uh, as chapter 11 goes on to show. Now in the days leading up to his death and resurrection, prior to receiving the glory he had before coming in the flesh, Jesus partially uh, retraced that exit from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. He taught in the temple courts on that Sunday, and on Wednesday morning, he was led from the Roman, Roman Praetorium, the governor's, where the governor was, you know, where Pilate was, to the east gate. And at the east gate, probably just before leaving out the east gate, because it says that Simon, the Cyrene, was coming in from the fields, coming into Jerusalem from the fields. So right there about the east gate, apparently, is where... Uh, uh, Simon was compelled by the Romans to carry the execution stake of Jesus across the Red Heifer Bridge all the way up to the Mifkat altar on the Mount of Olives where Jesus was crucified. Then, after he was resurrected and had ascended to the Father to be accepted as the first of the first fruits, he appeared to his disciples off and on for 40 days. We're told this in the first chapter of the book of Acts. On the 40th day, on the 40th day, with the 11 and other disciples watching, Acts chapter 1, verses uh, about 7 or 8, 10, right in there, uh, while they were watching, Jesus ascended, where? From the Mount of Olives up to the right hand of the Father in heaven. All right. But this was, he was not, he did not have his glory that he had back in the time when he was God the Word. Remember he prayed there in chapter 17, you know, Father, I'm gonna, you're going to give me the glory I had with you before the world was? Okay, he did not have that glory then. So he did not fulfill what Ezekiel is talking about in Ezekiel chapters 10 and 43, especially not chapter 43. So let's go chapter 43 of Ezekiel, because here Ezekiel records the return. Ezekiel 43, verse 1, again from the Tanakh translation. Then he led me to a gate, the gate that faced east. And there, coming from the east, was a roar like the roar of mighty waters, was the presence of the God, or the glory of the God of Israel, and the earth was lit up by his presence. The vision was like the vision I had seen when I came to destroy the city, the very same vision that I had seen by the Kabar Canal. Forthwith I fell on my face. The presence of the Lord entered the temple by the gate that faced eastward. And then a, or better, the Spirit, carried me into the inner court, and lo, the presence, or the glory of the Lord, filled the temple. Now Zechariah records what happens prior to his coming to the east gate. Because verse 43, Ezekiel sees him coming toward the east gate, of course, he's coming from the east. In Zechariah chapter 1, Zechariah, I'm sorry, chapter 14, Zechariah 14, verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst, that is, the spoil of those living in Jerusalem. 
Verse 2, the New Revised Standard goes on. For God says, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses looted, and the women raped. Half the city shall go into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So there will still be 50% of the people living in Jerusalem. So, verses 1 and 2 prophesy of the event that begins the 1260 days, or the three and a half times, or the 42 months that Jerusalem is under control of the beast, or the king of the north, or the Antichrist, which is the times of the Gentiles. It's three and a half years. Okay? Verse 3 goes on here in the complete Jewish, I, I'm sorry, in the King James in verse 3. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. This is after the three and a half years, the times of the Gentiles, has come to a close. He shall fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So verse 3 prophesies of the final bowl plague that is immediately followed by Jesus leading the saints out of heaven, all of them riding angels in the form of white horses, who engages, Jesus who engages and destroys the armies that attempt to resist him, according to Revelation chapter 19, beginning about verse 11. That's where he comes on a white horse. Once the battle concludes, Jesus will then go to the place from which he ascended to the Father ten days before Pentecost of A.D. 30. Verse 4, And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Now, his feet will not stand on the Mount of Olives until he is ready to enter Jerusalem to begin reigning, as we just saw in Ezekiel chapter 43. Now, verse 5, the New Revised Standard goes on, And you shall flee by the valley of the Lord's mountain, for the valley between the mountains shall reach to Azal. Nobody knows exactly where Azal is. The meaning of it, nobody knows either. And you shall flee, note, as you fled. You shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. The splitting of the Mount of Olives will cause a massive earthquake to shake the foundations of the city of Jerusalem. Just as the earthquake did when King Uzziah went into the temple in order to offer incense. This, of course, will require the end-time inhabitants of Jerusalem to flee to safety, just as the inhabitants of Jerusalem fled in Uzziah's day. The ones included in this phrase, you shall flee, can only refer to the physical inhabitants of the city. Because by this time, it can't be talking about the saints going into a place of refuge, because by this time, the saints have already been born as immortals. This is three and a half years later, as verse 5 goes on to say here in the New Revised Standard, Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Jesus, accompanied by the first fruits, will come from hovering over the valley, because when he stands, it splits in two, so they're hovering over the valley, where the Mount of Olives once stood, and move from there, from the east, toward Jerusalem and enter into the city. So, that, again, hopefully answers the question. But I know there are people who think, well, this is talking about Christ is going to come, it's going to split, and then those who are assembled in Jerusalem run down through the valley, and they go into a place of refuge, and it doesn't work. Because the you has to be talking about those who are the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So, anyway, looks like time is up.